What are some of the more common retirement questions that financial planners and financials get? Well, here to talk with me about that is Dana Onspot from Sensible Money. Dana, welcome. Hi, Bob. Great day to have you back, Dana. We are working our way through the 10 most common retirement questions that you receive as a financial planner, financial advisor. And we're on number nine, which goes like this. Should I become more conservative with my investment portfolio as I near retirement? Should you become more conservative as you near retirement? If we had a crystal ball, that question would be easy to answer. There is a rule of thumb out there that many of our listeners may have heard where you take 100 minus your age, and that is what you should have in equities. So, for example, if you were turning 60 this year, you'd take 100 minus 60, and you'd have you know 40% in stocks. By the time you turn 70, you'd only have 30% in stocks. The challenge with that rule is that's actually a pretty conservative portfolio. So one of the ways that your portfolio can help you keep up with inflation is to have a appropriate amount or appropriate allocation to riskier investments, such as stocks. We prefer those in the form of stock index funds, or you could say real estate could also be a hedge against inflation. So if you get too conservative, your portfolio may not have the potential to grow enough to fuel the withdrawals that you will need later in retirement. Another approach is to take a very a static view of asset allocation and to say by the time you near retirement you should be about 60% stocks, 40% bonds and you simply rebalance every year. And there's a lot of research that shows how various withdrawal approaches would have held up using that portfolio and in general they they hold up pretty well. The third approach, and of course there's many more than three, but one of the third mainstream approaches is something that uh, Michael Kitsis, he's a, a finance expert that, that produces a ton of content for other financial advisors. He has a, an article where he talks about something called a bond tent. So if you think of this time period called the retirement red zone. It's the five years leading up to retirement and the five years right after or the first five years of retirement. And so he proposes a strategy where as you get close to retirement, you are building up your fixed income holdings, treasury bills, CDs, agency bonds, safe things that are going to mature to meet your cash flow needs. And then as you enter retirement, that bond tent is protecting you from any big market downturns during those retirement red zone years. So if you were to follow that approach, you may have a, a really high allocation to equities up until about the, you know, let's say five to seven years before retirement. Then you would have a much higher allocation to fixed income. And then once you were past that retirement red zone, you'd take a more moderate approach. So using that strategy could result in something that is sometimes called a rising equity glide path where you actually end up with a higher allocation to stocks once you're you're in your 70s and beyond. So that that's an interesting approach because it sort of flies in the face of conventional wisdom that suggests that you should become more conservative as you age, you're the 100 minus your age. Uh, but here's a case where you're actually increasing the riskiness of your portfolio as you age. Yeah, if you were to use that bond tent strategy, you're not necessarily increasing your equity to allocations by intentionally taking money out of bonds and putting them in stocks. Instead, what happens is as those bonds mature, you're consuming them for cash flow purposes. And in most market scenarios, when you when you test this over 30 year time periods, the stock allocation would have continued to grow faster than you were consuming the bond part. And you just, the end result is you end up with a higher allocation to equities. And we see that in our client base, where as they get older, we're more aggressively having to sell stocks to increase their fixed income because their their stock portion grew and, and, and you know, it grew fast enough to cover what they were withdrawing plus some. So the higher equity allocation wasn't, we put the money there on purpose, it was the result. And now we're trying to figure out how to keep it in a little more balanced position. Yeah. So while we're on the topic, there's another school of thought um, espoused by Moshe Molesky and, and others that suggest that you look at your Social Security or defined benefit pension plan as a fixed income security or a fixed income allocation of your portfolio and that when taken together, it may allow you to be more risky with the investment part of your portfolio given that you have so much uh, uh, allocated to fixed income in Social Security and defined benefit plans. 
Yeah, I've heard of that, and I've even seen that approach extended to taking a look at if you were to pay off your mortgage, you would consider that an allocation to fixed income, and thus you could have a higher equity allocation because you had a, a you know home that was mortgage free. Now. I get the the idea of it, and if you are a very engineer like listener, and you know think of yourself like Doctor Spock on Star Trek, then that may be a way to view it. I think most people don't think of their portfolio that way. They look at income coming in, like Social Security and pensions, as one thing, and they look at their portfolio differently, and they would be uncomfortable with a riskier portfolio. It just, you know, there's that sleep at night factor. When they saw the balances go through bigger swings, they just might not feel comfortable with it. What we prefer to do is first, you plan out where your cash flow is coming from. So you include those sources like Social Security and pensions, and then you are solving for what has to come out of the the financial portfolio. Now, one household may have all of their expenses covered by Social Security and fixed income, and their financial portfolio may not need to cover any of their basic living expenses. They could have a higher risk tolerance or a higher allocation to equities. But the next household may have Social Security and pension and still need a pretty large percentage of their financial portfolio to cover their expenses. So their allocation to equities would need to be lower. They would need to look at it differently. So I think taking a more customized approach to your household cash flow needs makes more sense than you know just saying, well, I have Social Security and fixed income, and so I can be more aggressive on the other side. Now, Another way of looking at that, which we learn in the RMA, the Retirement Management Advisor view, is through something called a household balance sheet, where you take the present value of your pensions and your Social Security and all your expenses, and you're creating a ratio, what we call a a household fundedness ratio, similar calculation to what pension plans do to determine if they are funded or not. And so that can be a way of of I would say including that social security and pension in a a much more you know much bigger picture view on on how well your retirement is funded but it's still not getting down to the nitty gritty of how how should we allocate the remaining financial portfolio yeah the, the the last question I have Dana is often when I think about whether someone is a has a conservative portfolio or an aggressive portfolio uh, oftentimes people use risk tolerance questionnaires to identify whether they're a conservative or aggressive or income oriented. Uh, and oftentimes those are um, in, perhaps inaccurate, right? They're, they're maybe reflections of how people feel at the time, given how the markets are performing. Any thoughts about the degree to which people should use risk tolerance questionnaires to identify their what their portfolio should be? I have all kinds of thoughts on that. <laughs> I used risk tolerance questionnaires for years, and you would find that in strong markets, people would say, oh, yeah, you know, I'm completely comfortable with risk. And during down markets, they would say, oh, no, you know, I don't want any risk. And so I do feel like the way people answer those is swayed by current market conditions. I'm much more a fan of risk capacity, which is measured by an actual financial planning process, meaning what is your required minimum rate of return? Well, let's say in order to meet your financial plan planning needs, meaning how much cash flow do your financial assets need to produce for you and when do they need to produce it? Let's say your required minimum return is 3%. And today you can lock in 4.5% in treasury bills or other safe investments. Well, you wouldn't need to take much risk at all in order to have your financial plan work and to meet your cash flow needs. On the other hand, let's say someone has a required minimum return of 8% to meet their, their needs in retirement. Well, they have a couple choices. They could either say, well, I'm going to have to take some risk or I will never even have the potential. Now, when I say potential, it doesn't mean your portfolio is guaranteed to earn that 8%. It, it may not, but you know you'll never earn it if you lock in safe investments at, at a lower yield. And so in order to even have the potential to meet that, you would have to take on some risk. So I think risk capacity is is a more appropriate measure as people are nearing retirement, it's particularly if, if they take the time to educate themselves about the market and the difference between short-term volatility 
as you and I are recording this, the S&P had a record day yesterday. I think the NASDAQ was up some crazy amount, like close to 9%. And so you have this crazy volatility. Now, nobody complains about the volatility on the upside, but it can occur, as we've seen this year, on the downside also. And you have to be able to step back from all of that short-term noise and, and focus on the long-term. And then your risk capacity becomes a, a more appropriate measure. So we started with one question. We added plenty more. Um, Anything we missed? Well, you know, when it comes to portfolio allocation, if there's anything we missed, it's I think there's a lot of advice out there and it can be really confusing to people. And when I step back and look at the different views and the different things I read, oftentimes multiple views are right, but they're all looking at different time frames. So one person may be saying, well, you know, you have to do this, but their time frame they're making that decision from might be three months. And the next person may have a one-year time frame. And the next person may be looking at things in terms of a three or a five-year time frame. And the next person may be giving advice in terms of a 10-year time frame. So I think it can help to try to filter all of the various advice that you see by really stepping back and getting clear about you know, what is the time frame that the, you know, the person offering the advice is talking about. And you'll find that multiple uh, you know, pieces of advice can all be right depending on which time frame they're, they're referring to. Yeah, so it's a really a matter of what's right for you as opposed to what you're reading. It's uh, it's really focusing on your facts and circumstances. Your facts and circumstances and the person offering the advice, right? What facts and circumstances are they referring to and are they clear about the time frame they're talking about? Dana, always a pleasure having you share your knowledge and wisdom with us. It's uh, greatly appreciated. Thank you, Bob.